we get inside the minds of amazing individuals of amazing comedians amazing people entrepreneurs multi hyphens it doesn't matter what on this show it's all about the discovery and i hope that you got a good feel for what i discovered today and that's just dope energy <laughs> ladies and gentlemen you already know what this is this is gold mine what up world i want to say what up what up what up and i'm coming at you with a nice little piece of energy today because i'm in a good mood why am i in a good mood well it's because it's gold mines and i'm in a good mood when i do gold mines because i'm i'm in a position to get some gold and give some gold how do we do that we do that by talking to amazing individuals personnel people talent creatives I can go down the goddamn list. It all happens here on Gold Mines, and today's show will be no different. Another amazing mind we have, another creative mind, and I get to dig on this one. I get to dig, guys. I'm talking about a writer, director. I'm talking about a man who's accomplished some amazing things in the business, who's made some pivots, who's done some redirecting and, 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 and chose paths to make new paths, only to create better paths. Writer and director of American Fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the one and only Cord Jefferson is all gold mines. Welcome to the show, Cord. How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. Thank you so much for having me. That's right. Take that energetic introduction. You yeah, take it. Yeah, it's you, a real yeah. honor. This is. I was not expecting that. It's no. early in the morning on Memorial Day weekend. There you go. There you go. There you go. We gotta. You, you gotta get it done before you get to the fun. That. <laughs> the, the, the fun comes after the work, man. And it's not you. until not until you. the work is done that you that you truly sit down and relax. And this is a moment to celebrate you, to celebrate the work that you've done. Um, you know, I I I know where I want to start. But what I want you to be aware of is that, you know, it's it's about flowers on this podcast. And I've talked that. to a variety of people. And the dope thing is always understanding the story attached to the person, you know, before the success. And this is an opportunity for people to um, get to know you that don't know you and people to uh, fall for you after understanding you more of you. And what I want to do is start, of course, at the beginning. I love to go to the beginning because, you know, nobody um, necessarily knows at the gate what it is that they want to do. And when yes, you sir. talk about writing and directing, um, sometimes those things are discovery, sometimes they aren't. For you, I feel like they kind of were uh, more yeah. of a discovery because you started, you started in the space of journalism, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, right? Yeah, absolutely. I was a journalist for about eight or nine years before I started working in entertainment. And that, and out the gate, was that the choice? Was that a love or that was something that you fell for, no, you know, man. out of school? So this real, this really, if we was start at the beginning, beginning, it's like my mom said that she knew that I was going to be a writer when I was in third grade. And it just took me, uh, you know, a couple decades to realize that she was correct. I, I always loved writing, but the problem for me was that, you know, I didn't know artists growing up. I knew people who like played in bar bands on the weekend and I knew people who like, you know, painted as a hobby, but I didn't know anybody who made money from creativity. And so I think okay. when you don't, when you don't meet those kinds of people when you're younger, that it starts to feel like that's not for you. Like that life path is that life path is for people who live in New York and Los Angeles and Paris. And I was from Tucson, Arizona, and I didn't know anybody like that. And so it took me forever to to realize that you could actually I could actually make a living from writing and and, and <laughs> so so journalism to me was a was a good place to start because it felt like it was a professional career it felt like I could tell my parents what I was doing and that they could tell their friends what I was doing and it wouldn't sound so crazy so um, journalism was just kind of me pussyfooting around the idea that maybe I could make money from writing and so I did that for about eight or nine years before I fully kind of leapt into the deep end and said like actually i'm gonna go full on and try try screenwriting as well <laughs> you know what's funny is like when you say journalism it's like when you found out that you can make money uh doing yeah, journalism. Man. it's it's i i attach it to stand-up comedy and and the reason I'm why sure. it's like and and stand up when you first start it's like well how the fuck am i gonna get paid 
right? Like where, where's the money come from exactly. or when does it come in? Because everything is pretty much um, an opportunity. Everything is like, well, I'm doing this to hopefully get seen so that I can then do or so that I can then become. Um, with writing, where where are the breaks in the beginning? Where are the, you know, like what what's the road to the dollar? It's like, you know, you start off, of course, I would assume um, with any type of editorial or yeah, any yeah. type of, you know, uh, job search for. And is it, is it just like a lot of um, test, test pieces that you're writing to see if you can get hired? Just explain that to me a little bit. Yeah, it was just, a, so I just started out as a freelance journalist. That was my, that was my for, first foray into journalism. It was, I had a day job. I was working at a, uh, a very small nonprofit um, in Venice Beach, California. And that was my day job. And I, I really disliked it. I felt unfulfilled. And so every night I would come home and just write. And I would just write on my own. And I would write articles or essays or sort of whatever was moving me. And I wasn't writing them for anybody to be published. I was just writing them because I felt like I had to write them. And so one day at a party, I just met this guy who was a magazine editor of a music magazine. And he told me, um, he told me that he was looking for writers. And I said, you know, I've, I've always been interested in, in, in writing, could I, could I write something for you? And he said, absolutely. And so he paid me $50 for my first ever <laughs> published article. I got $50 and uh, we went from there. And so eventually I started doing enough freelance journalism that the amount of money that I was making was, I was making so much, I was making so little money at my day job that it felt like, um, I'd reached a point in my freelance journalism career where I was making around the same amount of money. And I, and I was like, well, I'm making so I'm making no money in my day job and I hate it. Why don't I try sort of like making no money? at something that I'm enjoying. And so that was, mm. so I just quit my day job and I just decided to write full time. And it was like writing an article here and there for a music magazine and writing an article here and there for a different newspaper and then writing a, an article for a different music magazine and a website and, I slowly started cobbling together a career in writing, but it was like, you know, I was making like $25,000 my first, my first year. Was, doing it. What, what, why, why the music and why, like, uh, was it that pretty much what, was that what was presenting itself or was that kind of where your passion was at the point? No, like man, what, that was what was presenting itself. I just did, I did it. anything. I did anything. I'm sure like the way that you did as a comedian, I'm sure you played some wild spots. Like I'm sure that Absolutely. you played for no money. I'm sure you played mm -hmm. like barber shops, like weird plays. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so I was doing the same shit. I was just like, I will write anything for anybody. You don't have to pay me. You can pay me $5. Like I will just do anything because you just need that. Re a, you need to sort of like have clips. So, so you have to have, you know, it's like the way actors have reels. We, you, journalists have clips. So you send out your clips to people and say like, here's my resume, here's work that I've done. But then B, you just need like reps in the gym. Like you just have to yeah. shoot, you know, you just have to sort of like yeah. get read, get better at it and sort of like start to understand the, the technique more and start to understand the, um, the craft more and, and just start to feel better as you do it and start to find your voice. That's also what you're doing the entire time you're writing is finding what your voice is as a writer and find out what kind of artist you want to be. So I was just doing that for everybody. I was doing, you know, I was doing the free writing for exposure thing like that. that mm -hmm. I just, I fully, mm -hmm. I fully enveloped myself in that. And like, yeah, it's embarrassing and it's, and it's, you certainly end up writing stuff that you don't want to write and you work for people that you don't want to work for. But overall sort of it, it's what really helped me get on my feet when it came to being a professional. I would even, I would even remove the word embarrassing, right? I don't, mm. I don't think uh, attaching the word embarrassing to it is fair because to your I point you. that you just made, you just said like you're building a resume, more importantly, you're getting your legs, you're getting your voice and you're, you're getting your reps in. Um, what, what would you say at that point? Right. Um, although it's the, like you said, you're coming up probably with like $25,000 a year when it's all said and done at that point, what acted as your big breakthrough in journalism? Was there a moment where it was like, Oh shit. Like, did you have a, Oh shit, wait, this is going to get better or be better. Or was it kind of like a, um, a, a pretty even kill for you? Like just a, a, a street with not too many peaks, hills and valleys, just kind of one level. No, no. It just, you slowly start to see that, you know, all of a sudden it's like, 
you're not out there hustling anymore. All of a sudden people are emailing you and asking you to write for them. Like, right. Like, so all of a sudden that happens. It's just sort of like a slow progressive build. And so all of a sudden it's like, Oh, okay. They're asking me now. And it's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And it's like bigger editors, like from, from like more well-known publications are reaching out to me to ask me to sort of write for them. And it's just this slow accumulation where, you know, it's, it's one of these like overnight success things where it's like, there is no overnight success, right? It's like, you just, slowly chip away at the sort of like um you slowly chip away at sort of like dig and dig and dig for the sort of for the pot of gold like that is every day you just get closer to it and so it was a slow accumulation for me to the point where it was like I don't know if I I ever feel like there was like a a real perfect breakthrough moment it just felt like okay I'm building a profile I'm building a profile and then by the time my journalism career was over um, I'd reached a pretty, I'd reached a pretty comfortable point. I was making, uh, I was making enough money to sort of like provide for myself. And I, I had started to, I started to feel really financially comfortable, but not like, I wasn't like wealthy by any means, but I just, I wasn't, I wasn't scrimping to get by the way that I had you when were cool. I first started. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah. mm-hmm. and then also I had people reaching out to me. And so it felt like, okay, this is, that's what, that was the scary, that would, you know, that was the real scary thing about jumping into entertainment was because it felt like I had finally reached, I had finally found my footing in journalism. Like I had, it had taken me like nine years to get there and I finally had it. And then somebody came to me and they were like, you know what, do you want to start over in this other career and in entertainment and sort of like, see if you can do it here. And, uh, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take the leap. Let's try it. And that, that, and, and I think that that, that was again, terrifying to start over, but, you know, it was, it made all the difference. It totally changed my life too. So where, where did the idea for entertainment writing come from? Where, when did you go, you know what, man? Like, okay, I've, I've been in this space of editorials for a minute. I've, I've, I've experienced the world of journalism. Okay. Got it. Done it. What what's this TV shit about? What what's this? How do I how do I crack that code? What are what the script writers and what are they doing over there? The 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 people that are writing movies and all of that. That's that's a different level of money. How do yeah. I start that? Yeah, where did that where did that idea come from for you? I had always I had always wanted to explore film and TV writing. It had always been interesting to me, but I was like Again, it was like, that's not for me. That's for people who grew up in New York and L.A. and have, have you know, parents who are producers and directors and editors and sort of like know people in the business. It just didn't feel like that was, again, like my arena. And so I lived in L.A., but I didn't know anybody who actually worked in entertainment. It was very weird because I was in journalism and sort of I didn't really interact with actors or writers or directors I, that was not my world and so it was like I was driving past all these studios and sort of like driving past Paramount into the Fox lot and so it was kind of like wondering what was going on in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory it was just like I don't know anybody who goes in there I don't know anybody who comes out of there but I, I I'm sort of like desperate to see what's over the wall and so fortunately um, one day I was just I'll tell you this is this is sort of if there is like one big breakthrough moment for me, it was this. It was I wrote this article for um, the last publication I was working for and MSNBC. This host from MSNBC, Chris Hayes, reached out to me. It was a satirical article. And, and, and Chris Hayes reached out to me and asked me to come. I'll just explain the the article was like it was like uh, a, a bunch of white kids who went to a surf festival in Huntington Beach had torn apart Huntington Beach on like a Saturday, like they had sort of ripped it apart and had this riot and they were looting and getting in fights in the streets and acting crazy. And so I wrote this article that was a satirical article about sort of like where are the white parents because the white children are out of control and like they're listening to all this like punk music that's making them sort of like anti-authoritarian and they're, listen, you know, they're sort of like doing drugs and acting crazy. And it was the, you know, the exact kind of article that like Bill O'Reilly would have written or anybody mm-hmm. at Fox News would have written when it's sort of like black kids doing the same thing. And so mm-hmm. I wrote that. It did pretty well. 
and then Chris Hayes asked me to come on MSNBC by, and do. I did do, pretty well. By did pretty well. Do you mean circulated? It was yeah, circulated. yeah. It did nice, numbers. Okay. It was sort of like gotcha. it was. We had numbers on all the articles, so you could see how many people were reading it. And so it did. Mm-hmm. It did very well, sort of on on the site. And so uh, Chris Hayes asked me to come on and do a uh, like a sort of satirical uh, uh, bit where we sort of just basically pretended we were on Fox news talking about white Mm -hmm. kids and sort of like what's wrong with the white youth and where are the white parents and that then blew up. And so about four months after that came out, I got an email from a guy named Mike O'Malley who uh, was a writer and an actor himself. And he said, listen, I I saw that thing you did on Chris Hayes and I wonder if you'd come in and, and, uh, work on this TV show that, that I'm creating called Survivor's Remorse. And so Survivor's Remorse was my first ever TV show based loosely on LeBron's life. LeBron James was an executive producer. And so that was mm-hmm. my first TV show. And, and the way that I got it was because he saw me do that MSNBC thing. And I almost didn't do that MSNBC thing because I was tired and thought that I needed a haircut. And I almost said no. And I still think about that. I Like, I think that that is sort of something that I think about all the time is just saying yes. Like uh-huh. st- when you're early in your career, just saying yes <laughs> to stuff that seems crazy or that you don't want to do, just saying yes as much as possible to new opportunities because those are sort of like the moments when I really do think big, big breakthroughs can happen. And that was my big breakthrough was I said yes to this weird opportunity and like the person who would eventually – because. I didn't, I hadn't written a script at all like that. Like I hadn't, I hadn't written anything before. That was just, that was just me doing my job and somebody, somebody seeing it um, just by chance and asking me to come right on a TV show. So which is that, so, which is so, it's so crazy and random, but at the same time, like, no man, that it changed that's my life. How the opportunity, yes. Yeah, like that's, that's how the opportunities happen. That's how exactly. They like, like you have you're, no you're, idea when you go perform if who's going to be in the audience, right? No. Like it's like on that specific night. No, but the the one thing that you can be and that you try your best to be is prepared, right? Like you you exactly. try to be prepared for the moment. And what I'm hearing from you, you know, in this time, yes, random, random, it may have been, but you being prepared not only for the moment to write the article, the article receiving the attention, coming on, doing the bit, the bit then growing and more attention comes where now people are going and searching the name and seeing the work underneath the name. And it's so, so much material, right? So the exactly. things that you could have overlooked early on, well, these things are now adding to the factor of what you can possibly do. So exactly. I wonder if this guy has ever thought about doing X Y and Z, I'm going to bring it up to him. And the suggestion then springboards into so much more. This is great. I I, I love it. Okay, so so go. So keep going. So so at this point, all right, fuck. Things are things are turning. So it was it was crazy. It was so it was my first ever TV show. I had to I was making and it was a scary jump because I was making more money than I ever made in my life as my (laughs) as a journalist right then. I was like I said, I was finally feeling stable and comfortable. And I went to my boss and I was like, listen, could I go do this TV show? Because the TV show, the the project was only 13 weeks. They were guaranteeing me 13 weeks on the first season. And so it was three months of work and then there was going to be nothing. And so I went to my boss and I said, could I could I just go do this and come back? Because I'm not sure if, if I can get another job after that. And he was like, sorry, if you want it, you're going to have to quit. And so I quit my job and I was getting paid less. I was getting paid less money writing for television that I was getting paid at my other job because I wasn't even allowed to be in the writer's guild yet. So they were paying me what was called the neophyte rate. Mm -hmm. So I was taking a pay cut. I was only guaranteed 13 weeks of work, but you know, I just said, fuck it. I was like, there's something out there. Let's try it. Let's see if we can do this. And you can come back to, you can come back to journalism if you need to. And so I just took the leap and it was, you know, writing up until that point had been such a solitary exercise for me. It was something I'd done alone with my computer. And all of a sudden to be in a room with other writers and you're not just collaborating with other writers, but you're collaborating with directors and actors and Mm -hmm. costume designers. And you're sort of, I realized that that to me is the most fun about, about 
the work that I do now is just sort of the collaboration and working with really smart people and funny people and people you respect. That is, it's like, it's like the most fun group project that I used to hate group projects in school. Uh, but sort of like, it, this is a group project now that I really like, because it's like in school, you can't pick your partners. It's just like, you get assigned and you're like, fuck, I hate that guy. But, but, but you know, this one, it's like, you're, you're able to sort of build the community that you want to be in and you're able to work with the people you want to work with. And that is, that's sort of like, it, it exposed a whole new world of creativity to me. And so as I did it and I did it for 13 weeks and then the job was over, but I was like, I love this and I want to keep doing it. But then I didn't have another, I didn't get another job for eight months. I went, I went, I went without work for eight months after that. I thought for sure, like, well, here it is. I'm on rails. I'm going to get a second job. No, because my, because my manager, I finally got a manager and he was like, the first job is the hardest. Don't worry about it. And you got your first job really easily. So don't worry. The second job is going to be there. And then the second job, I was like, really? I, I finally emailed him. I had like a real terrifying come to Jesus meeting one day where it was like, I was getting kicked out of my apartment because somebody had bought the building. Um, it was hot. LA was in a heat wave. Uh, I hadn't worked for eight months and I was just slowly eating into all this money that I'd saved up to keep sort of like a nest egg for myself. And so I finally emailed my, my manager and I was like, yo, you need to tell me if this is actually worth my time because mm. I can't, I'm not like a rich kid. I mm -hmm. can't go ask my parents for money. Like I need to, I need to work. It's been almost a year and I haven't worked. And so I was like, I don't begrudge you convincing me to do this, but I need, I think I need to go back to, to journalism at this point. I had a good time. I had a good run. It was fun, but, um, you know, I think I'm headed back to journalism and, and he emailed me back, you know, within like a couple hours and was like, listen, I understand your, I understand your frustration, but I think we're close to something. I think we're close to, to a job just please give me like, give me like another month. And if nothing happens after another month, we can reassess. And so I said, okay. And within two weeks, I went and met with Larry Wilmore. Um, like two weeks after that, I went and met with Larry Wilmore when he was shooting his last episode of Blackish. Um, and then he was going to take the job as the host of this show called The Nightly Show in New York. And so I went and mm -hmm. met with him. And he, I was the first writer that he hired for that show. And so I moved to New York at the end of 2014 a life um, full of jumps i mean full, man like, you gotta dude, like you gotta you got I, so far i just want to say we're on our third jump we're on our third fuck it yeah I'm man doing, you know you got the first one you, you had a job <laughs> you weren't the job you're like i'm not making money with this yeah. shit you know what i might as well just go ahead i'm gonna go ahead and try this 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 journalism shit uh, exactly. i'm just gonna do it all right fuck it you did it did after that and doing that you know what man this opportunity presented itself is 13 weeks but after that i don't know what's going to happen but i feel like i can find another job in journalism because i did it before i'm confident in my ability over there but i don't know let's see where this can take me fuck it then after that okay man god damn it larry talked to me he said he wants to be in new york i don't know uh i mean i'm by myself I said, uh, you know what fuck it i can always come back i love it yeah man i love it i love that's the, the way you got it you have to be but you have to be i think that sort of like you must have done the same things i feel like you just have you have to be adaptive like you 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 have to just be like i can do that i can do that and you and sometimes you need to just say like and that was another thing for me was like i would just get up and leave like i would and it was hard on relationships it was hard on friendships because i was i would just be like i'm moving to new york next week like this is what i need to do I, i'm i got a job there or i'd be in new york and say i'm moving to la next week because i got a job there it wasn't i was just malleable and i just was sort of was willing to willing to leave and, 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 and go follow, follow my career. And so, you know, you, there are a lot of jumps and, and sometimes you have to leave people behind and sometimes you have to, um, you know, miss out on things that you want to attend, but it just felt like there was, there was an opportunity there. And so, um, I followed him back to New York. I'd lived in New York before, but I followed him back for that, for that job. And then work has been pretty consistent since then. So that was, we started that show in, December of 2014. And then 
I've been basically working pretty steadily in TV since then. So that was that I went for like that eight month drought and I came very, 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 I was seriously within like days of quitting and giving up and I just stuck with it. And I, like, that's why I tell everybody, it's like, you have no idea how close it could be. It could be right around the corner. Like that, mm-hmm. they, they, you have to, and before you have before, like the, the real lesson I, I tell people is, is like, if you want to, if you want a career in the arts, if you want a career in creativity, like you need to find purpose in just sort of like making, making stuff. Like you need to find, like, like I always tell people like, let's get real. It, it is such a crapshoot this, this life. And like, you need to sort of like, before you enter this world, you need to, you need to actually consider like, what if you don't make it? You know, what if you quote unquote, don't make it? What if you, what if you never, win awards or get rich or famous or whatever make it looks like to you. It is it still valuable to you to do the thing? Like, like I said, like I would come over my day job and just write just because I needed to do it, you know, just because I love to do it. I didn't, I wasn't even before I was making any money from it. I just found value in the making of stuff. Like if you can't find like Vincent Van Gogh died broke you know, like he died penny, penniless is like, uh, Edgar Allan Poe died largely unknown. Like, like so many of these people who we consider household names now died, uh, without anybody knowing who they were, but, but they left behind all this art because they found value in making the art. You know, they didn't find they, they weren't looking for like, I need to make it and make money and be rich. They didn't quit because they weren't getting rich off the thing. They just made it because they were like, I need to do this. I need to paint. I need to write. And so to me, if, if you cannot find value in just doing that without being famous or being rich, then I just always say like, don't, don't do this, you know, because you're talking about, no, 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 this is man. What you're saying is great. By the way, like there's, there's nothing better when, when like you, there's nothing better when when I'm like okay I I like this I I like I like the conversation because the conversation is so dope because what's being said I not only can relate to but I feel like people need to hear it so yeah. when I'm quiet it's like things that are being said people need to hear and when you talk about self fulfillment well there's nothing bigger right the the idea of self fulfillment is huge it's like mm-hmm. If, if you are not happy or if you do not understand the, the value in being happy with the thing you chose to do, then that means no matter what levels of success come with it, you're always going to be compromised at some point. But if you find like this significant amount of joy in just going after this thing and it's like, I love it. And you know what, man, if I crack the code and I get there, it's going to be so dope. But even if I don't get all the way there, I'm so happy at the fact that I'm doing this thing. I love exactly. that. And and one thing that you said that really like that really just resonated is when you were talking about, yeah, you said I was writing on a laptop by myself and with the television show. I got to be in a room with other writers. I got to collaborate. I got to engage with other creatives, with other artists. And what you find is that when you do that, that elevates your version of artistry. That, that, That takes your shit to the next level. Like you become a sponge and you take pieces away from this environment that you're now in or from the brilliant minds that you're now around. And iron sharpens iron. I'm I'm a firm believer in that. I'm a firm, firm believer in that. So, a lot of things that you're saying, you know, I, I genuinely, I genuinely like take and just smile at because it's the thought process that I too had. Like with stand up comedy, I'm, I'm good if it's, if it all goes away and I can get on stages for the rest yeah. of my life and I can just go to a comedy club and, you know, talk to 30 people, 50 people and work on some jokes. I'm happy with the concept of making people laugh. I enjoy that. The other perks and bells and whistles that have come along the way with it have been great. They've been great. And life has been great because of it. But I think the big piece of like smile for me comes from, well, I do the thing that I love. 
Yeah. And that, that's what I'm true to. And that's that's like what you're saying. And it's 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 refreshing to hear, it's dope to hear. And I hope the listeners are yeah. taking that away. You know, as well. do you did you uh, uh Carl Weathers, rest in peace, Carl Weathers? I was watching a uh, an interview with Carl Weathers after he passed, and he said he said, um, people come up to me all the time and they say, How do how do I become an actor? And he and he said, The thing that I always say is if you want to be a working actor. That is that dream is within your reach. You can go to acting school. You can sort of like learn the business and you can probably become a working actor. Eventually, you can be at sort of like you can get roles in commercials and you get roles in sort of like local theater. That's something that's with that's something that's attainable to a lot of people. He said the problem is, is that what what most people mean when they say that is how do I become a movie star? And he was like, and that I can't tell you, because if any if I could tell you how to become a movie star, everybody would be a movie star. And so. Mm-hmm. That's the problem is like, if you want to be an actor, do you want to be an actor or do you want to be a movie star? And that's the thing mm. that you always need to ask yourself when you're getting these creative fields. It's like, do you want to be a stand up comedian or do you want to be a celebrity? You know, like that, that is, that is a different thing. Do you want to be, do you want to be Kevin Hart or do you just want to do stand up? Because if you want to mm-hmm. do stand up, you can do that tonight. Anybody can do that tonight. And sort of like, you can do that for the rest of your life if you find joy in that. But if what you're looking for is like, well, I think I just want to be rich and famous. Then it's like, there's other easier ways to do that. Go, go to business school and be a finance guy. Like that's how you be, you can be rich with the sort of, there's a much clearer path to become rich than, than what we do. Because what we do is like, it's like I said, it's a crapshoot, man. It's a gamble for everybody. It's a gamble for everybody. And so if you are not willing to step into it and say like, there's a chance I'm going to do this for 40 years, and I'm still going to be broke and nobody's going to know my work, then if you're not okay with that, then don't do it. It's, it's, it's gems. Gems are being dropped. And I hope you guys as listeners are picking them up, man. All right. Court on the show. Uh, we do something where I fire off some rapid fire questions. Don't give them too much thought. Think about uh, not thinking and just give the best answer that you possibly can. You ready? Okay. Yep. First career mistake that you immediately knew was a mistake. Uh, writing uh, a script uh, that I felt like people wanted about sort of things that I felt like would be marketable and sellable, but didn't have any actual relevance to my life. Like I just I love it. I, I feel like. That, that when you get in here, you're just like, well, what's what do people want to buy? And so I wrote this, I wrote this whole TV show about a veteran from Iraq, an Iraqi veteran, and I was like, I don't know shit about this, but I was like, I think that I think it seems like people are probably interested in this, and he's an anti-hero and he's fucked up, and so I wrote that, and it was it's a it was a disaster, a disaster. <laughs> so I think that it's just always write what's personal to you, never write what you think people want to read. <laughs> All right, best piece of advice that you got from someone that you didn't want to hear it from? Ooh, uh, one of the worst guys that I ever worked with um, said a thing that I think about all the time, uh, and he said that discipline is a talent. He said, never forget that discipline is a talent as well. He said, if yes, some people have writing talent, but if you have writing talent and you can't bring yourself to sit down and write a script, then it doesn't it doesn't matter at all. So the discipline and sort of like being able to actually do the work, that's a talent as well and never forget that. Great. All right, what album is a soundtrack to your life? Ooh, uh Miles Davis kind of blue. Great that is choice. that is yeah, that is uh my dad used to put headphones on my mom's belly when I was in the womb and play that album for me. And so he always used to say that when I was a baby, just playing that record would calm me. And I feel like that way still to this day, every time I hear that. Flamenco Sketches in particular, that's my favorite song off the record. And when I hear that, there's something very soothing about it. I mean, um, goddamn, that's like, you get pissed off because I don't think I have any stories like that. I don't think my dad can <laughs> any, 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 any stories about it. I don't think they gave you shit. They didn't give you shit when I was in there. I wish I had. I wish I had something cool like that. Like, yeah, no, man, my dad used to put Richard Pryor on my mom's stomach, and that's how my funny j- I got nothing. I got nothing like that. <laughs> Yours right. is more organic, <laughs> though. Yeah, just that. Uh, Kevin, what's your 
saying? I don't fucking know. Uh, all right. Favorite movie that inspires you to this day? Last question. Anything good. Anything good. I think that it's what, what you said is steel, sharp, and steel. And I think that that's true. I think that for me, anytime I see, it's like when I see something and I'm like, that was like, there, there's nothing better for me than like watching something and, and something that makes me jealous. Cause I'm like, damn. Mm. I wish I would have written that. Like that to me is, that's what motivates you. I'm sure that's sort of like you feel the same thing when you're watching other standups and you're like, damn, that was good. It needs me, it sort of like forces me to level up a little bit and feel like I need to go back to the drawing board and sort of start working on my material again. I think that anything good is just, I find that, that inspires me so much. You can, baby. I can't give a better example. Uh, I couldn't agree more, right? You see good shit and it makes you want to write good shit or do exactly. good shit. Um, and that's what it should be. That's how the circle is exactly. to go around. Um, okay, dude, so we're talking Survivor's Remorse. You're talking about, you know, amazing rooms. You're talking about amazing talent. Funny thing is uh, one of my... Um, close friends, a comedian who's been on the road with me for years. That was his first big break. Really? Survivor's Remorse like was his first TV. His name is Naeem Lin. And he, he was, was on uh, it? Yes, he was he was casted oh, on amazing. Survivor's Remorse. And and I remember that time where he was like, yo man, the show, you know, I'm just hoping that things like really like stay true and 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 follow suit with, you know, with this direction, man. Like this is a big deal. Uh and That's I was amazing. like, man, congrats. Congrats, man. I, I just I wanted to keep going for you. And and yeah. he ended up getting like a nice little recurring part. Oh, that's Survivor's amazing. Yeah, That's it's dope. pretty dope. Yeah. Pretty, pretty dope. Um, okay, so let's let's keep it going, man. So so television, like you said, okay, fuck, this is now what you're doing. But now the opportunities are changing, the rooms are changing. Um, you as a creative, of course, you're getting smarter. Your understanding for the space is much better, much bigger. Um, when did you say, okay, well, fuck, I want my own. I feel like I can navigate in my own space and I feel like my resume is getting big enough now to where I can kind of lead the charge and get people to come underneath my my like creative view, my vision, my my series, my shows, my movies. When did that click in? And then of course, we'll get to directing after. Man, like I think that immediately, right? I think that so so if people don't know the way that the way the television largely works is is, you know, you'll be a writer in writers' rooms when you first start and working for uh, other showrunners on their shows, but a lot most people when they're in writers' room are working on their own material, so they're writing their own shows, they're writing their own movies, and so I was doing that pretty much from the beginning. I was I was writing my own shows and sort of sending them out, sending them around, and developing stuff. And so I sold I sold a show in 2015. Um, to HBO. And I was like, Oh, this is it. I'm set. Like, Oh my God. I thought that was, that's all you had to do. I just, you just go in there and pitch it and you sell it and you're done. I get, you get a show on the air. I was like, this is great. And then, you know, reality smacked me in the face and I developed that show with HBO for like over a year, I think. And then it died and they were like, sorry, we don't want this. And then that was the case for basically five years after that when I would sell a show and I'd be developing it and then so somewhere along the line it would die and the very last um the very last show that I I sold uh before the film um I'd sold to Apple and it was like it was, we got a writer's room it was the first time I'd gotten a writer's room together so I was running a room it was the first time I had writers under me it was like, oh, okay, this is this is building. We wrote the entire season of the show. We were getting good notes, and I was like, oh, this is this is going to happen. They were telling me where the production offices were going to be open, and then we had like two weeks left to go in the room, and they were like, actually, we're not doing the show. This is dead. <laughs> this is dead. And it had been sort of like six months of just of writing this and like they, being very confident the show was going to be on there, and that was like October of 2020, and so. Obviously, 2020 is a terrible year for everybody, but I had also just had the, the closest. It was the closest I'd ever come to the brass ring. Like it was like I'm going to get my show on the air, and then it just died. It just died, and there was nothing I could do about it. And so it felt like I was like, 
I felt in that moment, I was like, this is never going to happen for me. You know, I was mm. like, this is, mm. I was like, this is because there, again, it was like, I felt like what well, my job was going to be, I was, I was going to be a journeyman TV writer. Cause that's what I've been doing. I'd been working on, I'd been working on great. By that time I'd won an Emmy for TV writing. I'd been working on shows that were really popular and successful. And I, I was sort of like working all the time. I was always in rooms and I felt like, okay, that that's going to be your life. Like your life is going to be writing on other people's shows and that's okay. You can make a good living doing that and you can be creative and you can sort of like get work out there and you can be a contributor to great art. You're just never going to get to run your own thing because by that time I was pushing 40 and I was like, it's just not, you know, it's not going to happen for me. I'll just write, I'll just work for other people. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I was just, chilling um it was december it was the holidays of 2020 a couple months after after they killed the show and i was just looking for a new book to read uh over the holidays because i was going to a cabin with some friends of mine and my girlfriend and we were and we were gonna uh check out some um yeah just chill for for a few days before christmas and i bought this book to read and i fell in love with it instantly like it was like i was like within 50 pages i was like wait a minute this book is incredible it feels like this book was written for me i just relate to it so much and within 100 pages i'd written to my manager and i was like yo i think i found a book that i might want to try to adapt into a film like i don't know wow. if i don't know if we can do it but i think wow. that this is this is a book that i want to try to make into a movie and so by the time that i was done with it i was just dead set it was like the creative winds were back in my sails it's again it's like something is always around the corner. Like it's, if, if you just something, just whatever, whenever you have a failure, like it's just, just always remember something is right around the corner. And the reality is, is that the reality is, is that had that show gone, had I been making that show, there's no way I would have had the time to find and read this book. Like I wouldn't have been reading for fun. You know, I would have been working on the show that I was working on. I would have never decided to pick up this novel. And so the fact that I wasn't working on the show, the fact that the show got killed is what really was sort of like the the turning point that changed my life again, you know? I, I love, I love like your, your, your POV, just like your, your outlook is, you know what? It's like, it's not going to be that bad. Things will always get better. And, you know, when there's a moment of a down, the up will present itself again. It's like, you know, that that positive outlook on life or that um, that approach to to understanding. Right. How things can and will be OK. It's something that a lot of people struggle with. And and a oh, lot yeah. of people can't grasp can't grasp that that level set for you and just hearing you talk, man, you talk with such ease um, and, and your mindset seems so strong, especially in like in this space, right. Of, of how we're talking and what we're talking just about, you know, fuck it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it. And if it works great, if it doesn't, it'll be okay. I love doing this. I'm going to do the thing I love and nothing else matters. Where was that your parents installing that in you or instilling that in you early on? Or is that like, just, just from life, like is life just life? Where do you think you got that from? Uh, That is absolutely my parents. It's just, uh, there was never like, it was very much like my, my parents very much made it clear to me. They were like, they were like, your life is your life. And like, and like, like I read that I, I don't have children myself, but I read this article um, that said the number one, the number one skill that you can teach children to sort of like uh, not ensure success, but sort of like a, the most valuable skill you can give children Um sort of like to, to help them have a successful life is the, is the understanding that like life is not happening to them. That sort of like, they mm-hmm. can't just let sort of like problems wash over them and feel like they don't, they can't get up and fight back and sort of like make their own way. Like you need to give them a sense of agency over their lives and let them know like you, if when bad things happen, you can sort of like, I, rem- I remember my pop saying once, he's like, if the tornado comes, if a tornado comes, and knocks down your fucking house, you can either sort of shake your fist at the tornado or you can turn around and start rebuilding your fucking house. That's what he said. And I remember, and that like stuck with me. And I just, I always thought of that as like, are you going to shake your fist at the tornado and be angry at the world? Or are you going to turn around and rebuild your house and say, fuck it. 
I need a place to live and I need to rebuild my house. And I think that that just that resilience and that sort of that that um, that self-determination was always something that that my parents stressed for me. It was just like, you need to figure Mm. it out. And I think that that is the number one the number one thing that anybody can have, this is not for artists, but I think that artists deal with a lot of rejection. Uh, but everybody deals with rejection is resilience. Like that, that is, that is like every single person, but especially artists, like you get told no so many times. So and much, if you cannot, so much. if you cannot wake up um, after hearing no for like the hundredth time on this idea that you have and just go to work again and say, fuck it, I'm, I'm going to keep trying. Then like, again, not this, this is not a career for you, but that was, and that, and that's okay. Like, I think that I was listening to this podcast. Do you ever listen to this podcast? Dead eyes. You ever hear that? What is that? What is it? This is podcast. It's this, it's a podcast from this actor named Connor Ratliff, who, when he was, when he had just gotten out of uh, uh, acting school in the UK, he got a job in, in uh, band of brothers that, that Tom Hanks show about world war two. And it was going to be his first acting gig. And he was so excited. And he went to uh, the day before he was supposed to shoot his um, his scene. He got a call from the uh, his his uh, casting, the casting director or like his agent. And they were like, Tom doesn't want you for the part anymore. You've got dead eyes. He thinks you've got dead eyes. (laughs) And he was like, what? Tom Hanks thinks I have dead eyes. And so they were like, you have to come re-audition. And it was like, it broke his heart because it's like America's dad telling him that like his eyes are dead and he thought he had this part. And so he went and re-auditioned for him and then he lost the role. They fired him. They were like, sorry, Tom doesn't like you. Like he thinks you have dead eyes. And the dude quit acting for 13 years. He, he was like, he was like, it rattled my confidence so much that I quit acting for 13 years, like right after I got out of acting school. And so... He finally interviews Tom Hanks, like the last episode of the podcast. I don't want to spoil it, but he finally gets Tom Hanks on the podcast to talk to him about about sort of like his his sort of shaken confidence and failure in Hollywood. And Tom Hanks said he was like he was like the number one thing is just like that. He's like, I still get told no. He's like, I'm Tom Hanks and I still get told no. Like my things that I want to make still don't go my way. I fail. I sort of like don't get movies made that I want to get made like I don't get parts that I wanted. Like these are Mm -hmm. things that, that still happen to me. And so he's like, you just, you have to have resilience. Like that is the only, if you have nothing else, if you have no inherent talent, if you have no sort of like um, luck, like the number one thing that you need, like those things help, but the number one thing you need to have is just to be able to get up and go again, just get up and go again. You have to be able to do that. And the, and the greatest thing about our jobs is, I, I always tell young people, like, we are not athletes. We don't need to do our best work by the time we're 30 before our knees give out. And like, we can't, we can't throw anymore. Right. Like, like that's, yes. that's like what yes. athletes need to worry about. So like yes. this idea that you need to, you need to pop off by the time you're 26 or 27. Yes. It's like, no, man, you don't play for the Lakers. Like you, you have time. And in fact, your work is going to get better because the more that you live, the smarter you're going to get. The more work you're going to see, the more movies you're going to watch, the more books you're going to read, and you are going to get better as you get older. So, in fact, like it's okay if you don't pop when you're 25 because you can do you have the rest of your life to work on your craft, you know, like that you can do that. And so just take the time, get better and just keep going at it. Keep waking up and going at it. I I have to highlight what you just said, because, you know. It, it's funny, uh, not name dropping, of course, but I mean, by this time, no, the, please. the world knows and the fans know yeah. I have some great <laughs> relationships. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> when, me, when me and Dave, me and Dave Chappelle talk, you know, our, our conversations uh, at times get a little, get a little deep. And there's one time where Dave, uh, Dave, Chris, Chris Rock, myself, um, and Chris Rock, myself, Chappelle. So we're talking and we're we're having this conversation where we're like, hey man, it's kind of scary. But Dave goes, I feel like I can do this forever because I feel like I just now reached my prime. And when he says it, he's like, well, what do you mean? He goes, I do. I said, I feel like 
I'm in my prime. Like I, I like the, my ability to see the the board of connectivity is just different. How I can break a joke down, the story, the concept. And Chris was like, "Yeah, man." He said, "I kind of, I kind of feel like that too." I don't like to say it because it's scary to say it, but I definitely feel like. I got my legs under me to do this for a long time. And they was like, Kev, you know, your energy is crazy. So where are you at? And I was like, I watched Cosby. I watched a, uh, like this clip of Cosby and it was, Cosby was in Montreal. This is, this is, I don't know. It may have been like seven, eight years ago. Maybe I don't, I don't know the timeline, Mm -hmm. maybe nine. Um, But he did a show and he was old as hell on a stool for an hour. And, it was funny. Yeah, Despite man. all the shit that he has going on in his personal life, he was funny. And I was like, man, it's crazy that you guys say this because I personally feel like my energy attached to the things that I'm doing is only there because I keep discovering more stuff to do. Like I keep discovering, oh shit, new ideas, the, the concept of writing, producing, directing, developing, onboarding, um, you know what I mean? The business and, and building a business to hopefully have it acquired. There's so much, but I'm yeah. it's exciting to discover those things. But to your point that you just made, our conversation was all based off of we get better when we get older. Exactly. Whereas, whereas like the, the, the athlete, you know, the athlete gets slower, the athlete declines and, and the IQ of the athlete has to raise, but the ability to do as much as they once did is not necessarily there anymore. But for us, this brain, the, the muscle gets fucking ridiculously strong and aware. Exactly. Exactly. And that to me is the, that to me is the, I actually, I, I envy athletes in some ways, but I feel, I, I feel like it's, it must be so fucking hard because like I was talking to a friend of mine about um, this idea of, uh, I can't remember what it's called, like the gold depression or something. I can't remember what, but it's this idea that like there are Olympic athletes who after they win the gold medal, they just feel like bereft because they're like, well, what do I do now? Like I've spent my entire life trying to achieve this thing and I did it. And now it's like what I've focused on for my entire, the entirety of my existence now is over. Like what's the, like, what's the basketball player do when he retires like that? Is, and, they, and he retires at younger than I am right now. You know, like it's like, like I'm 42 now. And like the, that is, that is the end of most athletes careers. And yeah. so that to yeah. me of just like, I need to f- totally figure out my life again and what I'm going to do. That is so scary. And I feel so fortunate that I can just be like, no, I found my thing. I found my thing. And like, uh, it's not just going to be the only thing I do as I grow. Like you said, there's, there's just so many different avenues I want to explore, but, but it's sort of, I found the the foundation of the, of my thing and sort of like on that, I can build, I can build out for the rest of my life. As long as my brain's working, you know? Even if I'm just like a, sometimes I think I'm like, even if I'm just a brain in a jar, if like somebody has figured out a way for me to like send whatever thoughts I'm having in the jar, like I can still do my job, you know, I can still do the work and that's all you need. I I, I love the breakdown, man. I love your, your point of view. Um, more importantly, man, I, I love the transparency and this is, this is what I feel the, the listeners respect the most. This is what, you know, they look forward to. Um, and this is the value of this podcast. I can't, I can't end this without talking about your feature film directing debut, man, and the success attached to, um, American fiction, right? Like such, such an amazing amazing concept, um, such an amazing story. More importantly, such a great cast that you attach to this feature. Um, and then to receive all the accolades, right? Like you, you start to go and, and get into that space of award conversation and, and you're into the festivals, et cetera. Um, the directing bug, where, where did the directing bug come from and why? Uh, that actually came from, are you friends with Aziz and Sorry? Yeah. Like you've yeah. come across Aziz. So Aziz is a, Aziz is a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I worked because I wrote for him on uh, Master of None. 
And I was working on his show and he and I became good friends after that. And when we were working on season two of Master of None, we were talking about directors and he was like, have you ever directed anything before? And I was like, you know, I was like, I didn't go to film school. I don't know anything about cameras. And Aziz was like, he was like, I went to, he's like, I went to college for, I went to business school at NYU. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go to directing school. He was like, I just been on sets. Like he was like, I just hung out on sets and I watched what people do. And I like, I'm just like, and I have a vision and an understanding of what I want. And so I was like, he's like, you, you can just be a director. Like you just could just go, you go to set, you you're on set when you've written episodes, just pay attention to what people are doing and just go do that. And I was like, really? And I was like, okay. And that was, that was like 2016. And so he was the one who, who put that in the back of my mind was like that you can just go be a director because before that I was like, well, I got to go to USC film school. I got to sort of like learn about lenses and shit. And he was like, no man, just go to set. And so that's what I did. I just, when I was on set, I paid attention to everybody. And when I found that story, when I found that novel that I adapted erasure, I was like, this is it. I think that I found the thing that I feel, I feel I wanted to find a story that I felt like I knew uh, so deeply in my soul and bones that I felt like even if I go to set and I don't know anything about cameras and I don't know anything about lighting, what I do know is story. And I know these characters, mm -hmm. like I feel, I know these characters on a real personal level. And I know this story on a real personal level. And so that could be my roadmap, even if I, even if I don't know shit else about, about anything that goes on, 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 on a, on a film set, you know, mm -hmm. it felt bad. Mm -hmm. And so it felt, so it gave me the confidence and sort of the bravery to, to take the leap again. I, I, I love it, man. And you know, what Aziz told you, um, that's the best school ever. The, the guerrilla school of understanding. I mean, that's, that's how I grasped and, and learned it all by just being the fly on the wall, being the sponge, being the guy that was present for all the conversations that was happening around me that at one point I ignored. When you hear the yeah. director and the DP talking, when you hear the director talking to uh, the writers, when you hear the writers talking uh, to the cats, like all of these conversations are conversations where you would kind of just let them pass you by. Whereas if you just took the time to act actually sit and be present for a second, you would understand that you're in the best school possible. And exactly. then that discovery, that's when everything else starts to open up. You get that beautiful mind moment where you're like, oh shit, I get it. I get exactly. it. I see it. I can do it. You've made uh, a public statement before referencing um, imposter syndrome and and what it is or what it could be, what it could do. I, I just want some more context on that because I know, you know, after the Oscar win, um, that's a moment where you felt like this kind of came into play. Just for our audience that may not be aware, how could you provide some context and clarity for it? Yeah, man. I was So I was talking with Ryan Coogler about imposter syndrome. Uh, Ryan Coogler and I sort of did an interview together for Interview Magazine, and we were just talking about how no matter what, this was before I the Oscar, the, it was like no matter what level we reach in our careers, there's still this, you still sometimes look around and you're like, wait, I don't, I don't belong here. I'm tricking everybody. Like this is, this, this is uh, one day people are going to find me out and realize that like, I'm not deserving of all this. And like, that that's always with me. You know, there was a part of me, there was a part of me at the Oscars where I was like, did people really st like, I'm standing there <laughs> holding an Oscar award. And I'm like, I wonder if this is like, people are like scamming me. Like if this, are they tricking me? Is this a joke? Like people, um, do they just give me this Oscar to make fun of me? Like if it, it, there is always this nagging part of me, because again, like you just get so used to the rejection. Like you just get so, at least I did. I got so used to the rejection that to now be standing there holding an Oscar is like, wait a minute. No, they're going <laughs> to recount this and there's going to be like a moonlight thing and they're going to come on stage and take it from me. It just feels, it felt fake. And it just, it feels like there's a part of me at least that is like, you don't belong here. They're going to find out that you don't belong here. And so, yeah, like that is just something that I've always needed to push through is, is, is you always, again, it's just resilience. You always need to, you always need to sort of just push past that fear. I think that, for me, the, you know, any, the, if there's any piece of advice that I have for people is like that the best thing, uh, the, the, the number one 
creative choice that has sort of like helped my helped my life has been like there's always been something good on the other side of fear. So every time that I've been afraid that I'm like, I'm not up to this. I don't feel like I have the skills necessary to do this. Um, people aren't going to like this. Every time I've sort of like had those fears and then just said, fuck it, I'm going to push through them anyway and do this thing. All of the sort of like best moments of my life are on the other side of that fear. So it's still there. It'll always be there, but I just got to move past it. Um, dude, Core, I, I got to be honest with you, man. Like, you know, these conversations are always great because you don't know what to expect. And the one thing that I just guarantee is like whoever I'm talking to, um, it's in my best interest to get the best version of a conversation from them to be real, to be authentic. And you are everything plus more, right? Like I appreciate your, it, man. Your journey, your your road, um, how you have gotten to where you now are is super dope. And I hope the listeners really like resonated with a lot of stuff that you said. And the biggest thing that you really highlighted was just the ability to like, okay, like if things don't happen, it's fine, but just know and have faith that they eventually will. And you're not having faith because you're a sitting duck. You're having the faith because you're someone that's willing to do the work and that you're willing to go and put the best foot forward. And when you do that, nine times out of 10, you'll always get to the point of reward at some point in time. And you, my exactly. friend, are, are living proof that that concept is real. Um, I appreciate I thank it, you. Man. Thank you no, for taking the time. I, I appreciate it's a true the honor, conversation. Man. True but, honor. And, and I'm I such a fan I can't of yours. Wait to meet you in person, I, as as am I, man. I'm and, gonna. And I, I've I've seen you. I we've been in a couple of the same rooms, but I've never known you. So I don't. I don't. I don't want to annoy people. And so, so next time we're in the same room, I'll, I'm going to come up and say hello. Please. And it's not annoying <laughs> me, but, but please, man, it would be a pleasure to, to get some FaceTime with you, especially after this conversation. Thanks, um, bro. I, I thank you and I want you to enjoy your weekend now. We got the work out the way. You too, so man. Right now, thank yeah, you so yeah, much. Go, go have a good go one. Get a, yeah, you too, man. Go I'm going to the pool. And, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gold Mines. You know what we do here. We get inside the minds of amazing individuals. And today was no different. We talked to a creative mind, a great mind, and a mind that you definitely will hear more from. Corey Jefferson. We got down, man. This is Gold Mines. I'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.